From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, a member of the I Hear Everything Podcast Network. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. Here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast. I'm Benjamin Shapiro, the executive producer of the MarTech Podcast. And today we've got a special episode for you, which is going to be guest hosted by Doug Bell, who's the CMO of Chief Outsiders. Doug is a veteran CMO with a background in helping growth stage B2B SaaS companies reach their true potential. And I'm thrilled to invite him and some of his friends to take the microphone and share their knowledge with you, our loyal MarTech Podcast listeners. Okay, here's a special episode of the MarTech Podcast, guest hosted by Doug Bell, the CMO of Chief Outsiders. Hello, marketers. My name is Doug Bell from Chief Outsiders. And today, we'll be talking about AI's impact on the content creator economy. Joining me today is Annalisa Gooden, who is the founder and CEO at Catch and Release, which is a content licensing platform that helps marketers find authentic content from real people that aligns with their brief. Trusted by leading brands, including Disney, Nike, Amazon, and ESPN, Catch and Release provides a new path to licensing. And today, Annalisa and I are going to dig in and talk about AI's impact on content licensing. Okay, here's my conversation with Annalisa Gooden, the founder and CEO at Catch and Release. Annalisa, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Doug. It's great to be here. Well, it's good to have you. It's a great topic, especially for the new year. I'm going to ask a silly question, I think, but why do marketers license content? No, it's not a silly question at all, because I think it's worth really defining and explaining that. Content licensing is ultimately about ownership or usage. Ownership can be defined by a short period of time, like I own it for three months, or it can be I own it forever, or to use a scary word, in perpetuity. But licensing is really a process by which a marketer gains permission to use something in their materials, whether it's an ad or presentation of any kind. The person who's created something, whether it's a photo or a video, they're the copyright owner. They're the ones who own their work. And so in order for a marketer to use it, they need explicit permission. And that's called licensing. Sometimes licensing is the rights can be exchanged for a fee. Sometimes it's exchanged for a product or a different kind of value exchange. But I think at the end of the day, licensing is always about an exchange of value. Okay, so it could run the gamut from a typical commercial term, specifically around revenue share, potentially. Also sounds like it could be about bartering. But I'm curious, what are the economics of licensing versus developing your own content for marketers? Well, it can be extremely cost effective. Of course, it depends on what it is you're trying to get done as a marketer. But the alternatives to licensing are brands can custom shoot their own material. They can hire a director and a cast and a crew you know, the credit lists that we see at the end of films and TV shows, that's the production world. That's the custom production world. Craft services, insurance, pet handlers. These are the kind of things required to make a commercial come to life, to make a shoot come to life. And that's been the main way marketers have made content in the past is by hiring really qualified photographers and filmmakers to go create content on spec, really specific content to their needs. The opportunity today is that licensing can play a much larger role because there's so much content that's been pre-made out there. You see it on Instagram every day and TikTok every day and Vimeo and YouTube and the list goes on. And so marketers now have the opportunity to what Catch and Release calls search before you shoot. Before you go out and shoot, why don't you search the internet first and see what might have already been created that you can leverage. Of course, it requires licensing because you have to, but the benefits of licensing, which is your question, are really around economics and efficiency. If you can find and license something in a few days, that saves you weeks on a production shoot and in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it can be a very good way for marketers to scale and to scale at the speed of culture too, because they're using content that's just hit the internet. It's fresh, it's authentic, it's real. It reflects the zeitgeist, a moment in culture that's happening right now versus waiting a few months to create something that you hope hits the mark. 
Yeah, it's funny. I was going to highly recommend that people ignore everything you're saying and actually develop their own content. But then you mentioned pet handling. And I think that really <laughs> tipped me over as being a key part. But no, it, it makes a ton of sense. Really, what we're talking about is the economics are, do you want to go through the risk of generate or of producing content that may be, frankly, more costly and not have the benefit you're looking for? The thing I'm looking for here really, and it comes through really clearly in Catch and Release's value proposition. And I think that's really the beginning of our conversation around AI and AI's impact but it speaks to connecting marketers with authentic content from real people. Why is that important? At the end of the day, it's about building trust with your audience, which is not something you can buy. It's something you earn. You can't buy trust. You earn trust. Trust is strong, though. And it's a strong pull for people to make a decision to buy something or not buy something, to support a brand or not support a brand. So we've found in providing our service and in helping marketers measure the impact of the ads that they make using real content that trust is established quickly and on a couple of different levels. One is people like to see themselves. We're human. We're very vain. I'm sitting here. We have video on the call now and I'm looking more at myself than I am at you. That's just the nature of Zoom. I always have to go into speaker mode just to make sure I don't accidentally do that the entire call. But it's in human nature. We like to see ourselves. And so when we see something that we can relate to in an ad, a video caught in a moment that looks like something we may have just scrolled past on TikTok or something that represents a family that we might relate to or even ourselves, we engage more. We lean in. We want to listen. So it decreases the abstraction between an advertiser's message and the consumer on the other side. The other way that it fosters trust is that Marketers are licensing content from real people and paying them money for the license to use their photograph or their video. Those creators, as we call them, are going through the process of licensing and being treated like a professional. So when they see themselves in the ad and they know that they've been paid good money to be a part of that process and they feel treated well throughout the process, that also creates a bond. So it's pretty hard to break. But ultimately, it really comes down to trust. How do marketers, how can marketers build trust with their audiences as quickly as possible? And a lot of that has to do with the visuals that they use. How can we visually reflect back to our audience? How do we visually use our audience to reflect our brand? And that causes people to move, to change their behavior. What we want to talk about is understanding really the content licensing process here, Annalisa, and specifically how AI has helped. You're in this place now where we're talking about something that maybe is not typical for B2B marketers, which is what I'll call highly produced content. This is the cornerstone of what we've been talking about on some level, right? So we're talking about, again, we said pet handlers, et cetera. We're talking about licensing content that has a fair amount of investment that goes into that. That doesn't feel like a corner of content where we're seeing the insinuation of AI-generated content. So does this value prop change? Does it flex when we're talking about maybe less produced content? especially as it applies to more and more AI content flooding the market? I think there's a few things I'd like to disambiguate there. When we think about content being shot by creators all over the world, I mean, there's, I'm holding up my phone now, there's 5 billion people with this device in their pocket. It's professionally produced. With the click of a button, you can now enter cinematic mode or portrait mode, right? These are production capabilities that are now being democratized, to use another piece of jargon, but true, right? Now you have billions of people with the capabilities that used to only be reserved for the educated in the world of photography and film. So that's just a stigma I'd like to point out that we think, oh, creator content is going to be lower quality. Well, it kind of by the fact that the tech is there means it actually isn't. The other thing is when it comes to AI, there's this world of generative AI, right? Where you can prompt an AI engine like a MidJourney or an open AI to generate an image for you or a video for you. We believe there's a future for that in advertising. The licensing is one of the biggest blockers to it. Marketers are really skeptical about using something in a big public ad that doesn't have clear ownership or attribution. And it's hard for copyright law to look at AI and say, who can be attributed to this? Who owns it? Does AI? Is AI a copyright owner? That's kind of hard. AI can't take us to court, at least not yet. We'll see (laughs) what the future looks like. So who owns it? Does the person who prompted the engine own it? Well, not necessarily, because what if they used in the style of Picasso in their prompt? Doesn't Picasso get the rights to part of that? So it's a super messy, super interesting, if you're a copyright enthusiast, interesting area, but very unresolved. So for marketers, especially large public brands, they're a bit reticent to take the risk on using something like that. So what we've heard from our customers a lot is, fine to use it for internal purposes as we're developing ideas and trying to get a sense for what we want to produce, 
but not for the public, not for the sort of final end result. That could change over time as things become more clear, but that's the overwhelming sentiment we're hearing now. And there's going to be a tremendous lag in copyright law because at the end of the day, there's a certain amount of litigation that perhaps has to occur and a certain amount of amendments to the existing statutes and laws. Would you anticipate that being a multi-year iteration, a multi-year, if you will, evolution to better copyright law? And then what are we doing in the gray space? Well, it's actually, I think there's two. So that's copyright law ambiguity is one of the blockers. The other blocker is actually the quality of the content itself, which sounds funny because when you look at generated content online, one of the biggest responses is like, oh my God, look how realistic it looks. But realistic is just one attribute. Realistic doesn't mean authentic, especially when you're talking about video. I can show you several examples of AI generated video that would never communicate real human emotion in the way that brands want to communicate. So an authentic moment of, let's say, a child taking their first steps in a sunlit living room caught by the parent, an authentic, beautiful moment. There's probably crap all over the floor because this isn't a staged shoot. So this is an authentic moment between a child and their parent capturing on video a child's first steps. There's probably some audio in the background. There might be a radio playing. You're probably hearing the voice of the parent exclaim when it finally happens. AI is not producing video that looks like that or that feels like that, more importantly. Not yet. And that actually is many years away. I think copyright law is bound to catch up faster than the technology that can create video that we feel connected to that makes us feel sentimental or nostalgic. I want to understand something a little bit better here, which is we're talking about some of the vagarities of what we consider to be authentic content and how copyright law is sort of behind and lagging, but also this idea of authentic content as gender by AI is probably some years away from a capability standpoint. But in the meantime, there's a huge amount of great content out there. Marketers need to get to connect to that content. We talked about the reason why. Talk to us a bit about how content is being supercharged, if you will, by AI from a discovery standpoint. You make a great point, which is that there's trillions of pieces of content being added to the internet every day. In fact, it's a different internet now than when you and I first started this podcast, right? It's an incredibly evolving space, which poses an opportunity for marketers because the shot they want is bound to be out there. But where? And how do I find it? And how much stuff do I have to sift through that is not relevant in order to find the stuff that is? And we call that art curation. It's an act of curation, sifting through, understanding the brief, understanding the goals of the campaign, understanding the visual requirements for a campaign, and then saying no to a lot of things before you say yes to the ones that matter. So we have a team of curators at Catch and Release who are absolute experts at what they do. They take in a creative brief, they go out into the wilderness, and they pull back, they bring back only the things that are relevant to the marketer. The reality is that AI is helping us with that now a lot. We have creators who submit content to us. We structure a search experience around that content. The creator doesn't have to do anything by way of tagging or providing any metadata around their photography and video. The AI is acting as a curator, is looking at each asset, each photograph, each video, and saying, here are the qualities, here's the tags, here's the metadata we think will be important to surface to the buyer or the marketer. So AI is becoming an extension of our curation capability. It's becoming a technology we can apply to how discovery works by inferring what's happening in an image or a video and by teaching it to understand what's important to a human, especially a professional communicating human. Marketers are professional communicators, so they know the je ne sais quoi in an image or video. They have an understanding of the unspoken things that are communicated in an image or video. And so we're able to train our AI to do that, which is absolutely remarkable. And our curators are helping to train our AI. It's wonderful to see that that's possible. So you're getting to write content faster and probably the quality of what you're initially presenting is better. But I'm curious, why are we not just a common marketer's prompt capabilities away from finding the same content? What our engine has built is a capability to prompt an engine to return results. When we think about prompting an engine to create a piece of content on its own, we're left again with those capabilities limitations that we talked about earlier. Yeah, I think a way to frame this maybe is to say, where are you guys jumping in and providing value compared to, say, your typical marketer sitting in front of their console, ChatGPT, Claude, whatever LLM you're using that day? How is it what you guys are doing is different? Is that the human element? In other words, the people that have the instinct to curate the content or organize things correctly? compared to, say, somebody who's staring at ChatGPT and wondering how they're going to get to the content they need. 
Yeah, that's right. And ChatGPT is not helping a, a marketer search YouTube for the right video to use in an ad. ChatGPT is saying, what do you want me to make for you today? Which is an exciting proposition. It's just from a visual standpoint, it doesn't have the breadth or the depth visually that a marketer needs to tell compelling stories. So catch and release is the way that marketers can search the internet in the most accurate and responsive way. And we use AI to help our customers do that. And I imagine the complexity in the back end of that is, do I have the right to the content? Can I license this content? How can I use the content? Do I pay to actually apply to use the content? Well, yeah. And we've built the tools for that entire back end process. So we've built in licensability estimates where a marketer can see how likely a creator is to respond favorably to being licensed and to being approached for licensing. We set the marketplace pricing. We guide the creator through the process of relinquishing their rights during the specified period of time and for the price that they agree to. And our goal as a company is to connect, protect, and celebrate the storytellers and the creators. And so we want to create an experience that both sides really want to do again and again and again. We don't want the creator to feel exploited, taken advantage of. A lot of people on the internet who have access to these phones and are capturing high production value kind of user-generated content are not people that are necessarily professionals at licensing. So we like to make sure everyone at the end of the day feels like they've been treated fairly and treated well. Final question for you here today. And I think I'd like to try and pull together a lot of concepts together. We talked about why marketers, ultimately what the economics are for marketers to license content as producing their own. We talked about the importance of authenticity and we talked about AI potentially is influencing authenticity. And we talked about a lot of the value prop that catch and release brings to bear for marketers. I think the piece I'd love to understand a bit better is in what ways can AI help marketing executives optimize their content licensing strategy and their content production strategies to better go after the audiences they're looking to engage with? I think that one of the best ways marketers can leverage AI today is in the early stages of concepting and image generation, using it in storyboarding, using it as a rough tool to immediately put visuals behind words. When marketers think about going to market with campaigns, it's usually a two-pronged strategy of what's the script, what are the words that this campaign is going to use, and what are the images that are going to go with those words. AI, especially ChatGPT, is brilliant for the words. We've seen that. You've seen the ability for an AI engine to just give you copy for any number of different use cases, right? And so take it a step further. Apply it to the visuals. Give the AI prompt a script and say, show me what a commercial or a campaign might look like with these words in mind and see what it gives you. It's a very interesting way to think about jumpstarting or kickstarting an idea. And then the team can get involved in refining that and saying, okay, well, we like this idea. We like this approach. Here's how we might change it. What imagery are we actually going to use? Because we can't use the stuff that was generated yet. It's Maybe it's not high quality enough or the licensing rights are too ambiguous. So what are we going to go out and custom produce ourselves? What might we license from search and license using catch and release? What might we leverage from stock? There's a a bunch of different ways that you can execute a campaign afterwards. But I think it's a very interesting way to scale the initial sort of idea stages of a campaign when it's still in formation, when marketers aren't quite sure yet what they want to make. And it feels like it's getting you to the answer to the question of whether or not we should generate our own content or license content faster. Listen, original production is a $700 billion market. It's not going away. I mean, the number of incredible filmmakers and photographers and directors that continue to come into this industry are just amazing. So I don't think that's going away. I think it's really a matter of saying content licensing is a way for us to really grow and move faster. And it complements. There's a blend. Marketers blend tools together all the time. And content licensing is now becoming a formidable medium in their tool set of content creation. I think we've set up sort of a false paradigm, which I would love to bring you back and unpack, Annalisa, and that is this idea that content generated by AI is not authentic and content generated by humans is. And it feels like that is a sort of stark way of us unpacking what's happening in the world around us when it comes to content generation. But I think what I'm hearing from you is these things are likely to come together other over time. And, and you mentioned this really when I asked you about how do you deploy AI for better content and making those decisions? And it, and it feels like we're going to see more integration over time. But I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. It was a great conversation. Thanks for having me. Okay, that wraps up this MarTech Insider episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks to Annalisa Gooden, founder and CEO at Catch and Release for joining us. In part two of this interview, which we'll publish tomorrow, Annalisa and I are going to be talking about finding authenticity in the creator economy. If you can't wait until our next episode and would like to learn more about Annalisa, you can find a link to our LinkedIn profile in our show notes. You can also contact her on Twitter, where her handle is at Annalisa Gooden or visit our company website at catchandrelease.com.
Okay, that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks to our guest host, Doug Bell, the CMO of Chief Outsiders. If you'd like to get in touch with Doug, you could find a link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes, or you can contact him on Twitter, where his handle is Market Advocate. Or you could just visit his website, which is chiefoutsiders.com. Just one more link in our show notes I'd like to tell you about. If you didn't have a chance to take notes while you were listening to this podcast, head over to martechpod.com where we have summaries of all of our episodes and contact information for our guests. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you can even apply to be the next guest speaker on the MarTech Podcast. Of course, you can always reach out on social media. Our handle is martechpod, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or you can contact me directly on LinkedIn. My handle is Ben J. Shap. E-N-J-S-H-A-P. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a daily stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we're going to publish an episode every day this year. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app and we'll be back in your feed tomorrow morning. All right, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. 